Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in and joining us. We are so glad that you were here and let's go ahead and jump into worship together. Well, let's clap our hands. Let's do this. It's 11 o'clock, you've had breakfast, you've had your coffee. talk about how our God's changed our lives. Sing, but it couldn't fill me. But it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that faint are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. Here in your love There's nothing Oh, there's nothing 
it's so good to be in the house with you worshiping God today. Uh, man, it's a special day for us as we get to celebrate Holy Communion together. You know, we do this when we get to the end of a message series. I try to tell us this every time we do this. The reason we wait until the end of a message series to come and gather around the Lord's table for Holy Communion is because everything that we learn from the Word of God, it should always bring us back to the foot of the cross. It should always point us back to the place of rescue, where we were broken and in desperate need of a Savior because our sin, our guilt, our stain was on us. But Jesus came and set us free from that. We've been talking about how to be a quitter, how to quit living a life of addiction, how to quit living in fear, how to quit making excuses for everything in our life. And we talked about these things and it should always bring us back to the place that we know we're free from it because Jesus has set us free from it. So when we read the scriptures that says it, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free, that's what it means. It means so we don't have to keep living as an addict or living as a person that makes excuses for everything or living in fear or living in guilt and shame because God has set us free. He did it through his precious body and his blood. So I want us to go ahead and step out of the aisles. What I'm gonna ask you to do is just step out of the aisles. We'll divide the room in half here. You can grab a communion element on the table and return back to your seats. You can do that right now at this time. And hold on to those communion elements and we're gonna celebrate Holy Communion together. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are welcome to come and receive communion with us today. All the elements on the table are completely sealed so you don't have to worry about anybody having touched that for, before for you. And then I'm going to share what our next steps are in just a moment. that Jesus was going to go to the cross and on a Thursday night Jesus was with his disciples in an upper room and they were about to eat a familiar meal the Passover meal and Jesus took bread and he broke it and instead of praying a very traditional prayer that they were used to hearing for centuries and centuries and centuries in remembrance of God's deliverance of the nation of Israel from the bondage of Pharaoh in Egypt. Instead, he took this bread and he said, take and eat for this is my body that is broken for you. He took the very familiar and he began to make it about himself. He began to show us that Jesus would become the sacrifice for sin. For thousands of years, it was a Passover lamb that was the sacrifice to cover the sins of Israel. But Jesus said, this is my body broken for you, the body of Christ. Would you receive it? He took the wine and he poured it into a cup a very familiar thing that then became new when Jesus said, take and drink you all of it, for this is my blood shed for you in the new covenant for the remission of your sins. Jesus told them with no uncertainty, my blood is now the payment for the sins of this world. It's the blood of Christ shed for you. Would you receive it?
Thank you, Lord, that even though we could never earn it and we don't deserve it, that you poured your life out for us so that we could be made free from sin and death and guilt and shame, that because of your sacrifice for us and the fact that you were raised to life, that we, God, could be made blameless because you paid our debt of sin and you can raise us to life because you were raised to life. And so, Lord, as we remember you and your body and your blood today, we don't do that flippantly. It's not just another ritual that we walk through, but it is taking us to the moment where you atoned for our sin, where you paid for the sins of Nathaniel Thomas Mariner on that cross. That freedom is mine because of what you did. We as a church, we remember it that personally today. We insert our first name when we think about what you did on the cross for us. And no matter what comes in our life, no matter what difficulty we may face, we know that there is one who is greater. Jesus, you are above it all. That no matter how difficult the circumstances of life we face are. You are the champion, that you've defeated everything this world could ever throw at us. Victory is ours because it's yours. Forgiveness is ours because you offered it to us. New life is ours because you were raised to new life. We thank you for the precious body and blood. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen, amen. Hey, we've got a couple of ushers down to the sides here. You'll see Miss Mary over here. You can, I think you can see Dee down here with some baskets. If you'd like to go ahead and give your communion cup to them, they'll, they'll go ahead and collect those from you now. And we're gonna continue in worship of our great God.
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Man, it's so good to have you in the house worshiping with us today. Why don't you have a seat? We're going to have some announcements. Hey there, my name is Christina Matthews, and we just want to say thank you so much for tuning in and joining us here at Church Online. If you will, take a moment to fill out a Connect card. A QR code is about to come up on your screen. This is going to just ask a little bit of information about you so that we can answer any questions that you might have for us as a church and also how we can serve you better. Also, here at Peak City Church, we love to be generous. So if you can, go ahead and check in on Facebook and let people know that you are tuning in with us for every single check-in that we have. We donate $2 to an organization that's doing the most good in our community and all around the world. And last but certainly not least, we would love to have you updated on everything that's going on with our church so you can subscribe to our newsletter. Just head over to peakcity.church forward slash newsletter. So we've been in a series called How to Be a Quitter. We've talked about how to quit addiction. We talked about how to quit making excuses. You know, we, we've, we've gone through the list here. And if you'd like to catch those messages, you can always head over to our website at peakcity.church forward slash messages to catch all of those past installments of this series. And today we're actually going to be wrapping up with how to quit living in guilt. Ooh, I heard somebody go, ooh. <laughs> see, see, Church Online, there's just some things you miss, all right? Like, that was great. Sister, I, I appreciate you. Thank you for doing that. Don't forget, guys, if you want to amen the preacher, you can do that. You feel free to shout back, say amen. You can do that Christian mooing thing that we do now. You know what I'm talking about. You hear something good and you go, hmm. Like, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm fine with that. Listen, you just... Respond if Jesus is doing something in your heart. Hey, how many of you are excited about the weather today? Anybody? You like that hot weather? Y'all hot weather people. I'm not one of you, but I'm your brother in Christ. I'm glad you came to church today. I'll never understand. My wife is one of you, okay? Like, sure. Y'all be in your club together and enjoy your hot weather. Last week, it was like the Lord said, Nate, just another reminder of how much I love you. And when I walked out and it was like 30 degrees outside in May, I said, oh, thank you, Jesus, you know? And then all of a sudden, the 90s come roaring back. And now all of y'all are sitting, all y'all warm weather people. Mm -hmm, I see you. I'm looking at you. Thinking about the pool. Thinking about summer vac. Anybody going on a vacation this summer? Y'all excited about any kind of traveling you're doing? Okay, got a few people. We've got some claps in the house. All right, yeah. I get it, okay? Palm trees and 85 degrees. That's your thing. Give me a snow-covered mountain. I'm good with it. Yes, thank you, Lord. Somebody else. Hallelujah. Christina Matthews, Nate Mariner. Praise God. All right, y'all just should join, join this club. It's good. Good things happen, all right? You know? Anyway, so... Summer vacation's coming. I'm sure you're thinking all about it. Anybody ever had a bad vacation? Anybody? Anybody had a vacation that did not go the way that you thought it would? There is an eight-year-old boy in the back that went, yes! Let me tell you a story about when I was about eight years old. Oh, yeah, mom and dad are here for this sermon. This is going to be awesome. Remember that little trip to the mountains that we took? <laughs> Where we caught a hurricane in the mountains. Geographically, that is not supposed to be how this works, right? I was so excited. Eight-year-old Nate was going to go to Tweetsie Railroad. Man, chug a lug. See the cowboys shooting fake guns at people. It's going to be great. Did not happen. Instead, there was no Tweetsie. There was no Linville Caverns, because I think they were flooded out. There was no mountain trail hiking. Nope, just good old Mystery Hill. The only indoor activity you can do in Boone. It's like you go inside, and it's like this little, is it a museum, or is it a wax museum? Is this like Ripley's? I don't get it. There's that one spot where you can like set a marble down, and it looks like it's going to roll downhill, but it rolls uphill. It's amazing, right? Well, that loses its luster after, you know, you've been there for three hours killing time. So we were in a hotel room hanging out together while it rained and rained and rained. My poor parents were trying to put together a great vacation for us. Mother Nature did not want to cooperate. We got to watch cable TV. That was cool because we didn't have that at home, right? I mean, listen, I had some good frugal parents that saved their nickels. 
It was not the ideal vacation, but we were together. And that was nice. <laughs> but still wasn't Tweetsie Railroad. I'm 42 years old, and I've never ridden down the tracks of the Tweetsie Railroad. I just want you to know that. Now, there's a lot of different vacation plans that you can have that get spoiled as well. You think about it. Like, and there's just some bad ideas for vacations, too. Like, you don't ever want to go on that North Korean mountain getaway, do you? <laughs> Not a good idea, right? You're not going to set sail on that Somali pirate cruise past the Horn of Africa. Like, you're not, you're not going to tempt fate with those things. That's not a good idea. Bad trips, right? Well, one, there's a trip that we take every day, and you don't need to be taking this, and it's called the guilt trip. Yes, all of that was just to say that sentence right there, okay? Lots of research went into this message. I have got your attention. You know what we're talking about today, but we do it. Man, that is a trip that we go riding on and we expect it's going to have a different outcome, but it never does. It always leaves us feeling worse than it did before, weighted down even heavier. And listen, that's not something that we need to live with. It's something we need to repent of. So we're going to talk about how to quit living in guilt today. I, I just need you to know this. So many of your fears are created by guilt. They're exacerbated by guilt. It just, it inflames things. It makes it worse. The Phillips translation of 1 John 4, 8 says this. It says, fear always contains some of the torture of feeling guilty. Why are you torturing yourself? If it was for, for freedom that Christ has set you free, then why do you tell yourself, I need to feel guilty for a while before I can really be forgiven? That is not the gospel. So today I want us to talk about this because we all have this fear that lives within us that's bred by guilt. And there's good news today. You don't have to be taking the guilt trip anymore. If you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that is not a weight that needs to be hanging around your neck anymore. So today, here's all I wanna do. I wanna talk about what we usually do with our guilt, what the Bible says we should do with our guilt, and what God does with our guilt. And then we're gonna go home and we're gonna have some fried chicken, amen? Like, oh man, I saw a vegetarian that just went, mm. Listen, hey, I'm, I'm down. You eat your bread and have your celery, whatever it is you're going to do. All right. Let's talk about guilt. Let's talk about what we usually do with our guilt. Okay. Cause we're really good at these things and we need to stop. When we talk about what we need to quit, this is it right here. What we usually do with our guilt and we're great at this. We bury it. I got some Christian mooing down in here. I heard them. Mm, yeah. We bury it. Like we do. I, look, have you ever heard someone say you got to bury your past? That ranks up there in the all-time worst advice ever with follow your heart. Follow your heart. Nothing ever bad happens when you do that, right? Mm -hmm. Bury your past because that never comes back to haunt you. No, no, no. We got to deal with our past. Christ has dealt with it. We keep leaving it like an open book. But Jesus said, no, if it was finished at the cross, it needs to be finished in your life. It's time to move forward. But we bury it. We bury it. We do it in lots of different ways. We all have a favorite way of burying our guilt. Yeah, it's kind of like, what shovel do you like to use to bury your guilt? They're all bad ideas, but some of you try to use the shovel of minimizing it. Oh, it's not that big a deal, right? Well, then why are you still thinking about it 20 years later if it's not that big a deal? See, that's, that's minimizing it, trying to make it seem like it's less important than it actually is. Why does it then still bother you? It's because minimizing your guilt doesn't work. Shovel don't work. Some of you grab the shovel of rationalizing it. And you try to bury your guilt by saying things like, everybody's done it. You know, and you compare yourself. Listen, comparison is a deadly game. You compare yourself to people until you find somebody that's worse off than you. And you're like, Haha, I'm not as bad off as that lady over there. Congratulations. Some of you say, well, at least I'm not as bad as Hitler. Wow, big standard set for you there. Way to go, right? But we, we, we compare ourselves to other people and we rationalize what we've done saying, well, they're doing it way worse than me, so it must be okay. And this is how I'm gonna bury my guilt. I want you to remember this. Rationalize, that really means rational lies. 
Like, that's what you're doing. You are lying to you. You're trying to tell yourself something in your head is true when your heart does not believe it. So this idea of rationalizing your guilt to, to bury it doesn't work. Get another shovel. Some of you pick up the shovel of compromise. Oh, man, I think we've all picked this one up before, right? And compromise, what we try to do is if we feel bad about what we've done, we just kind of lower our standards and say, ah, well, you know, I keep on slipping up here, so I'm just going to accept that that's who I am. No. Listen, I used to be a sinner, and Jesus set me free by the grace of God, and I am not what I once was. I am who God is making me to be. But let me tell you something. You pick up that shovel of compromise, and it doesn't work. If you do something enough, it won't bother you anymore. And that's called a seared conscience. And that's a dangerous place for you to be. Burying your guilt does not work. Like Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. Whoever tries to bury all of that, it's not gonna work out well. You don't hide it, you deal with it in Jesus' name. Because you have to understand this, we live in a day and age where all your life is thrown out there on social media. Like that stuff is written in ink, not in, um, it's not written in pencil. You know, it's really fun being a preacher these days where everything that you preach is put on the internet and broadcast and locked forever in a time capsule called YouTube as well. So I got to watch what I say too. I'm right there with you. But you got to deal with your past. Bury guilt. Let me say it to you this way. When you bury it, you are wasting emotional energy because it's going to keep coming back. The zombie apocalypse is going to keep, ha- it's going to keep coming back for you. Buried guilt equals wasted emotional energy. You feel like you're just spent all the time. This could be one of the reasons. Like you've, you wake up in the morning, five minutes into the day, you've had it up to here already. Hey, this could be one of those reasons. This is what David said when the guilt was piling on top of him. He said it this way. He said, I wouldn't admit my guilt, but my dishonesty made me miserable and it filled my days with frustration. My strength evaporated until I finally admitted all of my sins and I stopped trying to hide them. It sucked all of his strength away until he stopped trying to hide it. So don't bury it, but that's one thing that we do. Here's another thing that we do. We blame others. Oh man, we're great at this. It's not my fault. It's their fault. You weren't there. It wasn't, you know, this, this is as old as the garden of Eden. Remember Adam and Eve were told by God, Hey, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this serpent comes along and starts talking to Eve and convinces her, Hey, take a bite. It's good stuff. Eve turns around, goes to Adam, gives him fruit, and he's like, oh, well, sounds great. This forbidden stuff? Sure, why not? Takes a bite. Gets found out in their sin, and this is what Adam says to God. Oh, this is great. He says, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, hmm, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Now, let me say it to you this way. The man said to God, the woman whom you gave to be with me, She gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. So Adam is trying to blame his wife and God. Any of you ever blame somebody else and God for something that you caused, that you did? Listen, I'll, I'll be man enough to admit I've been that foolish in my life. That's not a good place to be. But we do this. We'll blame somebody else as if it was their fault. The Proverbs 19.3 says this. It says, when a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. In other words, when somebody wrecks their own life, they get mad at God. Ever been there? Proverbs says that that's not the most abnormal thing that could happen to a person. And it's fixated in this idea of, I'm going to blame my guilt on somebody else. We are so good these days at excusing ourselves and accusing other people. Why? It spawns this victim mentality that we are not called to live in, but Christ has called us to rise above. It doesn't work to live this way. Why do we do it? See, we're trying to balance our guilt and our faults and our failures with other people as if that negates or deletes what we've done, and it doesn't work. 
somebody else might have been involved in something that happened in your life, you made the mistake, don't push it off on them. That's like saying, oh, well, you know, when I was three, my mom held my head under the water too long when she was rinsing my hair off. And now I have all these repressed feelings as a 35 year old. And that's why I went ballistic and raged on everybody at work the other day. Sorry, that doesn't work. Blaming somebody else is not going to help you be free from your guilt. Here's something else that we do. We beat ourselves up. All right, all the English majors, I do realize that there is a preposition at the end of the phrase that is on the screen right now. I got you, okay? Number one, I'm so glad you came to church today. Number two, this is why you, you know. Um, so we, we beat ourselves up. If I, if I put the phrase, we beat ourselves, that would not preach very well, all right? It's like, do we really? No, but we do. We beat ourselves up over our guilt, like we self-administer punishment. It goes back to that mentality of if I feel guilty for a while, then I'll be a better person. Listen, we do that to our children too. That's, it's amazing sometimes how, or we'll do that to our kids or to other people. Like they want to give you a half-hearted apology and you're not going to receive it. You're like, mm-mm, not going to receive it. I'm going to let you sit and let it fester for a while. That's not God, by the way. That's not the Holy Spirit of God leading you to do that. That's the flesh doing that. And we do it to ourselves. We beat ourselves up. Let me ask you a question. Can a guilty conscience make you sick? Yeah. Yeah, it can. I was a freshman at Emmanuel College. In one of my freshman level classes, there's a lot of commuters and resident students in those classes. So a commuter student, I don't know his name, don't know him from Adam, but I'll never forget him. He got caught red-handed cheating on an exam in that class. And my professor caught him, took that exam book, closed it and said, sir, you're going to be receiving a zero for cheating on this exam. Took his exam book away. He sat there for about five seconds and then vomited all over his desk. Ice cold. My professor looked back and said, well, now you're going to have to clean up your desk and your act. Walked away. Parents, Emmanuel College. The website is ec.edu. If you want to check that out for your children, that's a good place for them to learn some responsibility. Let me tell you. A guilty conscience can make you sick. A guilty conscience. Let me, let me ask you this. Can it contribute to depression in your life? Absolutely. People that, people that live with depression, they know it comes and it goes. But they will tell you that there are triggers when it comes to depression. And guilt can be a major trigger of depression in someone's life. And yet we, we harbor it. Like we beat ourselves up with it. Can a guilty conscience set yourself up for failure? Yes, it can. Because you tell yourself you don't deserve something and you'll talk yourself out of it. Or you'll never even approach an opportunity because you feel guilty. I know I work more hours than everybody else in the office and I have more experience and I'm better and I can do this job better than anyone else. And I've been here longer, but I, I just don't think I should ask for that raise. That, listen, that wackadoo stuff is what guilt will do. Guilt can wreck you and you will beat yourself up with guilt. Guilt has an amazing way of causing us to take punishment on ourselves. This is a way David phrased it when he was just struggling with guilt and anxiety and fear and it was barreling down on him. He says this in Psalm 38. He said, for my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. All of the day I go about morning. Listen, that is not the way you should want to live your life. But when we hold guilt and we beat ourselves up with it, that's the life that we're giving ourselves. Jesus came to do so much more for you. There is a better way than this. So if that's what we do with our guilt, what should we do with our guilt? Let's talk about it. What should we do with our guilt? See, the Bible is very specific about this, very clear, and it gives us some very simple steps on how to deal with guilt. Note this, I did not say easy. I didn't say they're easy steps. I said they're simple and clear from the word, but it doesn't make them easy. What should we do with our guilt? Here's the first thing. You got to own it. You've got to own your, somebody said, mm, I like that. You got to own your stuff. Listen, don't try to excuse it. Don't push it off on somebody else. Don't bury it. You've got to own it. Don't minimize it. Don't ignore it. Don't push it down. Don't deny it. I simply own up to it. I admit it. I say that was wrong when I did that. That was sin when I did that. That was foolishness. And I willfully chose to do the wrong thing because it's what I wanted to do at the time. 
That's owning something. Listen, I'll give somebody credit and character for owning their stuff that exceeds so many other things in their life because I know immediately about them that they're not a defensive person. Did you know that owning your stuff is the antidote for defensiveness? If people tell you you get real defensive all the time, start owning your stuff. It's going to cause you to say, you know what? I'm not going to try to put up walls. I'm not going to try to make myself look better than I actually am. I'm just going to be me. And I'm going to let the truth set me free. Amen. See, this is what we do when we own it. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. So call it for what it is. Say, God, you are right. I am wrong. And I'm going to own my stuff. And the next thing is this. you got to ask God to forgive it. Lay this at the feet of Jesus. Repent of it. Ask God to forgive it. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, <clears throat> he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So how do we ask for forgiveness? I want to spend just a moment on this. Because I think there's some wrong ways that we ask God for forgiveness. Can I touch on that for a minute? If that's okay, somebody say, mm-hmm. When we come before God asking for forgiveness, you don't have to beg. Listen, you don't have to beg for God to forgive. Do you, when you beg for God to forgive you, it shows that you don't realize the lengths that he went through for you for you to be forgiven. The atonement that he made for you when he went to the cross and when he suffered and died, he did it knowing that he was atoning for your sin and for mine. And when we beg him to forgive us, it's as if we don't realize what he's already done to set us free. So we don't have to beg God. Let me say it to you this way. I think he's far more willing to forgive you than you are to ask for forgiveness. That's how good, loving, and merciful our God is. And here's another thing. When you ask God for forgiveness, you don't, you don't have to bargain with God. Let me say it this way. Don't bargain with God. All right? Like, but we do it. Oh, Lord, if you get me out of this jam, I'll come to church every Sunday. I will volunteer to serve with the toddler room and Peak City Kids. Come on, somebody. I'll tithe 11%. Well, maybe I won't do that, Lord. That was a little crazy, right? But anyway. Yeah, some of you are all like, mm hmm. No, yeah. So, look, you do this, you bargain with God. And you put yourself in a place where you feel like you've got to say, God, I'll do for you if you do for me. No, listen, <laughs> you don't ever need to bargain with God. He's offering you a gift you can't earn. So, when you ask for forgiveness, you couldn't have earned that forgiveness in the first place. You can't be good enough to earn it. You can't be bad enough for God to not offer it to you. He does it because he loves you. If we ask God to forgive, he forgives. Romans 3.23 tells us that everything we just talked about is true. Because it says, for all have sinned. Hey, read that with me. For, come on, 11 o'clock, say it louder. For, have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified by our good works, our bargaining, how good we are at begging God to forgive us. No, we are justified by his grace as a gift. It is a gift that he gives to us. It is not something that we can earn. It's a gift that comes through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. Amen. That's good news. So we ask God to forgive it. So we own our stuff. We ask God to forgive it. We don't beg. We don't bargain. Here's the right way. We ask and then we believe. We believe by faith that God does what he says he will do. That I don't have to beg because I found the bread and his name is Jesus. I don't have to bargain because my life was already bought with a price at Calvary's cross. It's because of what Christ has done by faith. I believe that he is enough. The most basic truth of Christianity is this. That Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins on the cross. And your sins. And if you ask him for his forgiveness and you accept his forgiveness, he gives it to you freely. Forgiveness is not based on what you do. It is based on the grace, mercy, and love of Jesus Christ. So we ask for it. Amen. We ask for it. 
I don't know what you've done, friends, but I know what Jesus has done. And I know that what he has done is greater than what you've done. I know that what he's done will take care of anything that you've done. So you don't have to live with a burden of guilt and shame anymore. Let's talk about what God does with our guilt. So what we should do, we should own it and ask God to forgive it. And then here's what God does. He forgives it instantly. He forgives it right away. He doesn't say, I'm going to let you suffer in this for a little while, and then I'll forgive you. Maybe. That's not our God. He gives us grace and mercy and forgiveness instantly. He never makes us wait. And when you say, God, please forgive me, he doesn't say, let me think about it. No, there, no, there's no delay. It is instant. There's no waiting period. And there's this myth out there, and I've talked about it, that says, if I feel guilty, then that makes me a better person. No, it doesn't. It makes you a miserable person. And God didn't call you to have to live that way. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. He forgives you instantly, and he forgives you completely. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus, that you forgive me of all of my sin, not just some here and there, but this one over here and that guy, you're not gonna forgive. How do I know? The word of God tells me this in Colossians chapter two. It says, and you, that's you and that's me, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. In other words, you were as far from God as you could be. You were lost as a redneck in Starbucks. You were just far from God, right? All of a sudden, the Bible says, God made us that were dead alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. In other words, the whole list, God has wiped it out. And there's not a person or anyone else in this earth that could lift up the blood of Jesus and say, what is this mess under here? It's wiped away through a blood-stained cross because of Jesus. And I love this. And he set aside that record, nailing it to the cross. He put it to death when he gave his life so that we could be set free in him. We need to remember this today. He forgives us completely. I can have a musician come and play right now if anybody's available to do that. That'd be great. When Jesus died for your sins, you got to remember, he died for all of them. And your biggest sins, they are not too big for the grace of God. Can I say that again? Your biggest sins are not too big for the grace of God. Like, you can't out -sin God's grace. Some of us think that we can do that. Like, oh, there's just too much water in the bridge. I'm too far gone for the Lord to forgive me. Really? Really? You think that highly of yourself that somehow you, one person could stand up against the flood of grace, the scandal of grace that was given to you on the cross by Jesus, that lifted the curse of sin off of the entire world, past, present, and future, but you somehow, you, you've sinned too much and it's just not gonna work for you. No. You cannot out -sin the grace of Jesus. His love for you is deeper and wider than anything that you could ever imagine in your heart. See, he does this thing to bring us closer to him. And I don't want us to confuse guilt with conviction. Guilt is something that drives us away. You feel guilty and you want to avoid the people that you feel guilty towards, right? You try to avoid those friends, coworkers, family members, whatever, that, you try to avoid them, right? Guilt pushes you away. Guilt makes you not want to come before God and repent of something because you, you feel distance and guilt. Conviction, though. Conviction is God's way of drawing you near to him. Saying, hey, you stepped out of line, buddy, but I'm going to pick you back up. Come on. Hey, little girl. Dad's here. Give me a hug. I'm going to dust you off here. I'm going to pick you right back up. We're going to move forward again. See, there's a difference between guilt and conviction. God's conviction draws us to a place of repentance where we turn away from the thing that was trying to destroy us. It helps us to realize that we are not the thing that we have done, that we are who God says that we are. I Listen, before Jesus, I was a sinner. There's no other way to put it. I was a sinner. But when I experienced the grace of God applied to my life by what Jesus did, when he bought my life at the cross, and I said yes to his offer of mercy and forgiveness and freedom, 
and he forgave my sin. All of a sudden, I'm not a sinner anymore. I'm not who I was. Now I am who God says that I am. I am a saint because Jesus has made me that. Look, I believe in 12-step programs and I love what they do for so many people to be free from addiction. One hangup that I have with them though, especially like with AA, is that they say, once you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. Maybe we want you to stand up and say it, you know? I, I haven't had a drink in 35 years. My name is so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic. Listen, I, I believe firmly that when Jesus transforms a life, that you're not who you once were. And the bottom line is this, if God has redeemed you and made you new, the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So I'm not gonna be defined by my past and you are not either. If you're gonna stop living in guilt, you're saying, you know what? Jesus has dealt with that at the cross. I can't change my past, but Christ can change my future. And I'm gonna look to him, the author and the finisher of my faith. I'm not gonna let that hold me back anymore if Jesus has forgiven me and redeemed me from it. I'm not who I was, I'm not what I did. I am who God says that I am. Satan will try to personalize failure in your life to tell you you're unlovable, that you're used goods, that you're a failure, that you're unworthy, but you are not what you did. You are who God says that you are. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So let's stop living like we're still accountable for every single failure we've ever had in the past when God has redeemed us from it. Moses, in the Bible, he murdered a man. David one up that. He murdered a guy and had an adulterous affair with the guy's wife that he murdered. Peter said, Lord, I'll never deny you. One of the 12, one of Jesus' closest disciples. I'll never deny you. Denied him three times. Jesus said to him, you'll deny me three times before this rooster crows twice. And he did that very thing. All of them failed miserably and could have stopped right there in their guilt and their shame and said, I'm unworthy. I can, I'm disqualified. I'll never be of any use to God. But God in his mercy and in his grace, he had other plans. And I'm telling you today, he's got other plans for you. You look at the difference between Peter and Judas, Jesus' disciples. Peter denied Christ, abandoned him at his greatest time of need in his human life on this earth. Judas sold Jesus into that slavery to be handed over to, to the Jews to be killed. One of them repented and was completely restored. And another one let guilt and shame overwhelm him. And he went and he took his own life. Don't tell me what my God can do if you will do business with him today. If there's some men and some women in the room that say, I'm not living under this weight of guilt and shame anymore, but I'm coming before the Lord and I'm gonna lay it down at his feet. Because I believe that he will heal, he will renew and he will restore you. Don't let the enemy rob you of the future that God has planned for you. Just say yes to him today. Would you pray with me? If you'd bow your heads just for a moment. If you're here today, and this isn't an invitation for salvation, this is just simply an invitation for everybody that's been living under the weight of guilt. You might be very much a Christ follower, but you've just been trapped in this prison of guilt. If that's you today, and you're saying, you know what? I'm not living that way anymore. I, I, the past is in the past. I can't change that. But Christ has redeemed me from it. So because of what Jesus has done, I'm laying that at his feet today. And I'm asking for forgiveness of that today. If that's you and that's what you want for your life, nobody's looking around. I'm simply asking you to raise a hand. So I just know to be praying for you. Bold people in the room. Wow, wow, wow. Let me lead us in a prayer. Just in a moment right now, just pray with me. Jesus, for so long I have let the past define me. And now I'm gonna stop looking at that as the definition of who I am. Lord, I repent of that. I'm asking for your forgiveness for letting that define me and my life. Lord, I believe that I am who you say I am. And I believe that you can take that mess in the past and you can use it for your message.
God, I believe in my heart today that the setbacks of the past are just a set up for a comeback in Jesus' name. I believe that you've planned something for my life that's bigger than me, and I, I'm asking to walk into that right now. I want my eyes to focus on what you're doing in my life and what you're going to do through my life instead of the failures of the past. Lord, I lay my guilt down at your feet, and I ask for you to take it in Jesus' name. I repent of it. I ask for you to forgive me of that. And I'm moving away from that. I'm moving towards you in Jesus' name. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for hope that I have, God. Thank you that you define my life, that I am who you say I am in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed, if there's somebody here and you've never taken the first and most important step of asking Jesus to forgive you, to be your savior, you, you don't know much, but you know you want God to make you brand new today. You wanna put your faith in Jesus and ask him to make you a brand new creation. Why don't you simply lift a hand and say, that's me. I need God to make me brand new. I wanna ask Jesus to be my savior. I'm not gonna parade you down front. Nobody's looking around, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're watching at church online, why don't you click the button that says, I raise my hand. And if you're here in the house right now, let's wait just another moment. If there's somebody that says, that's me. I wanna ask Jesus to be my savior. Praise God. Praise God. You can put those hands down if that's you that lifted a hand in this moment. Why don't you pray a prayer that sounds something like this. Jesus, I need you to come into my life. I need you to forgive me of my sin. I'm empty and I'm broken. Lord, I don't just need you to, to rebuild the pieces of my life. I need you to make me brand new. So I'm asking that you would put a brand new spirit inside of me. I believe that when you died on the cross, you paid for my sins. I believe that when you rose again to life, that you, pro you proved who you say you are, that you defeated sin itself, you defeated death itself. And Lord, if you were raised to life, I know you can raise me to new life again. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. I'm turning away from my old life. I'm turning towards you, and I want to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, can we celebrate new life in the house of God today? In Jesus Christ. Hey, can we celebrate some people that say, I'm not living in guilt. I'm not living in shame anymore. But I'm going to live in the forgiveness and mercy of our great God and our Savior. He's been really, really good to us. I hope that the past several weeks has been food for your soul. I can't wait for you to come back next week. We're going to kick off a brand new series talking about the fruit of the Spirit. It's called Fruition. Yeah, get a load of that right there. We can't wait for you to come back as we lean into the fruit of the Spirit. Why don't you stand to your feet if you're able to? We're going to worship God together in song and with our giving. So before we go, I just want to say thanks to everyone who gives so faithfully towards the vision and mission of Peak City, seeing people's lives transformed each and every week by the power of the gospel. It's incredible. I'm so, so grateful that I get to be on this journey with you. And if you're a guest here, please don't feel any obligation to give in the offering today. Uh, we just want you to know that you are our honored guest. we got a gift to give you at guest services before you leave, just for showing up today to say thanks for being out here. And no matter how you give, if you give this way, somebody asked me the other day about Cash App. The church has a cash tag. If you'd like to give that way, you can come and ask me about it, and I'll tell you about it as well. If you want to give and there's a way to do it, We'll find a way in Jesus' name. So thank you so much for your faithfulness. If you want to give physically, you can do that. There's some baskets on a table as you leave here today, and you can give that way as well. I'm going to pray over our offering, and then we're going to lift our voices and worship to our God. Jesus, thank you so much for today. God, I thank you that you are here among us, that you're with us, and that you're able to rescue. God, I thank you for new life that's taking place today. I thank you for those that were far from you that aren't, that are saved by your grace, that are transformed by your mercy and by your love. I pray that every gift that's given today would be used exactly how you want it to be used for your glory and the upbuilding of your kingdom. Thank you that we get to give joyfully. God, I'm so grateful to you for all your mercy and your blessings in our life, that we get to witness your power at work in your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song that says, Christ is enough. You can clap your hands if you want.
with us today we can't wait to see you back as we kick off a brand new series next week go and bless somebody go and be the church and go live a life that's free of guilt in jesus name amen amen god bless you we'll see you next week man it was so awesome being able to engage and worship and dive into the word together today thank you guys so much again for joining us and we look forward to celebrating again with you we'll see you right back here next week